In the past few videos, we looked at public blockchains and discussed some of the underlying concepts that are needed to understand smart contracts. Now it's time to start with actual smart contract programming. In this video, we will look into the basics of the Solidity programming language, mainly different variable types and the structure. And most importantly, you will get to deploy and interact with your first smart contract. So let's get started with the basics of the Solidity programming language. And the first thing you have to know is that uh, Solidity is the most popular programming language for EVM-based smart contracts. So remember that what actually gets executed on the EVM, what actually gets executed on the blockchain as part of the consensus is bytecode. And Solidity essentially is an abstraction that helps you to write something in human readable code that later on gets compiled to bytecode, which is then executed on the blockchain. So it's really this high level human readable language that has a lot of influences from things like C++, Python, and JavaScript. In particular, if you're familiar with JavaScript already, this may come in handy structure-wise, and uh, you will see where these comparisons are coming from. It is statically typed, so you have to declare the variable types uh, when you're deploying the contract. It supports inheritance. That's something we will look into later on in this lecture. Libraries, and what's super helpful is that you can define your own complex types. So depending on the contract, you may want to create your own complex type, and you can easily uh, declare that with Solidity. What's important to understand is that it's still on the rapid development and there are regular breaking changes. And that's rather unsurprising considering how young this technology is, a uh, smart contract that is. So whenever you are at the frontier, be it in research or also in the private sector, then of course you have to adapt more quickly, more frequently. And that's something we can see here with uh, Solidity or more generally with blockchain, of course. The good thing is once you have a good understanding of the concepts, and I think this class will be very helpful in this regard, then you can more easily and more quickly adjust to these changes. Uh, so it's, it's always good to have a basic, a good basic foundational understanding of things. And that's exactly what we're trying to achieve here. If you wanna look at the most recent version of Solidity, you can uh, use this user documentation right here. Um, so it's docs.solidity.org. And uh, much of what you're seeing in this lecture, many of the definitions uh, are based on this documentation. It's a really good documentation, and there will also be the occasional reference to this documentation. So uh, I highly encourage you to actually look at the documentation, read through it as well. Um, not necessarily for this class, but once you're uh, hooked and you want to do more sophisticated smart contracts, then of course it's always a good thing to look at the uh, documentation. Now, the first thing you have to understand is how to structure your smart contracts when you're using Solidity. And as you will see later on, there's this license statement right at the top. But after this license statement, the first line of the actual contract is always the Bragma statement. And the Bragma statement is essentially you defining the version of the compiler you're using. So basically the translation from Solidity to bytecode, which version of translation you are using. Now, of course, you could use it without this little caret symbol right here. I will come back to that exactly it means um, in a little bit. And, and in this case, it would be 0.8.9. Uh, caret means just anything uh, that is at least 0.8.9 until the next breaking change. Now, what does it mean exactly? Uh, it follows the semantic versioning guidelines uh, so it's major, minor, patch. So major version, minor version, patch. And what's important to understand is that breaking changes with Solidity only come with new minor versions or of course major versions, but there isn't a major version yet. So for example, the switch from 0.8.x to 0.9.0 that would be uh, would contain breaking changes. So that's something where you potentially cannot use your old code anymore if you're sticking with, um, if you're going with a new compiler. 
Now, that doesn't mean that you have to throw away your smart contracts. First of all, it doesn't affect anything that is already deployed because recall that is deployed in bytecode on the blockchain, so you can completely forget about that. And it also doesn't mean that you have to throw away your old code. You can simply just use the old compiler version. But what's important is when you have written a smart contract a while ago and it was intended to, intended to be used with an old compiler version, then you have to stick with that compiler version and don't use the new one because then it could lead to breaking changes. The caret symbol, so this symbol right here, um, is commonly used. So most people actually use it uh, as we did right here. And it means including any future versions until the next minor release. Uh, so in our case, what it would mean is any version that satisfies version, version is larger or equal 0.8.9, okay? So it includes whatever you're specifying here and is smaller than 0.9.0, so smaller the next minor release. Um, that's the, the idea of this caret. Uh, and what's important is whenever you have a, a project that consists of multiple smart contracts, then you should use the same pragma in your project, so don't go with um, multiple different versions, compiler versions in the same project that could mess up things or make them at least more complicated. So when you look at the basic structure of the contract, um, besides the Brockma statement, which you can find right here, then you see at the very top on line one, this license identifier I've talked about. So in this case, we, we, we uh, declared the MIT license, uh, but you can also go with unlicensed. It's not that important, but you, you cannot or you should not admit it. Uh, it's actually expected. And then after that, you have the Brockma statement we just talked about. So basically where you're specifying the compiler version. And then we, we start with the actual contract. Okay, so of course you define that with the keyword as you would expect the contract. Hello world in this case is the name of your smart contract. It's best practice that you're using upper camel case for uh, your small contracts. So you start with a capitalized letter. And whenever there's a new word, you also use a capitalized letter curly brackets, and then this is your basically your uh, function, uh, excuse me, your contract body right here. Okay, and as you can see, you have multiple ways to define comments, so there isn't anything yet in here, no instructions whatsoever. Whenever you use these double slashes, then you have a comment on that line, and also when you use slash, star, asterisk, then uh, anything between these two statements is a comment. So it doesn't really affect your small contract and it's only for the documentation purposes when somebody else reads your uh, contract. And that's actually super helpful. I can tell you that in many cases, people, when they are studying your smart contracts, of course, they have to they have to look at the uh, individual functions and everything that is written that actually counts um, with respect to the logic, but also these comments, they can be really helpful to understand uh, what the original developer tried to achieve. So the next question is, how are things stored on smart contracts? Now, smart contracts themselves are part, of course, of the blockchain. As you know, they get deployed on the blockchain with a deployment transaction. They have their own address. But then every single smart contract has their own storage. Okay, And you can think of this storage, and that's a simplification. Um, the structure is different in reality, but you can think of it a little bit as just this uh, unbelievably large array. Hmm? So basically an array with uh, many slots, an unbe <laughs> unbelievably large number of slots, and the unbelievably large number is two to the power of 256 minus one. So anything between zero, that's the first slot, and two to the power of 256, that's, uh, that's a slot you can use. And each of these slots has a size of 32 bytes, 256 bits, okay? That's, so basically that's the storage of the smart contract. Now what's important to understand, obviously not all of these slots uh, are being used because that's just an unbelievably large number. Uh, there wouldn't even be, I mean, uh, it's, it's such a large size, we cannot imagine anything like that, but that's just the potential number of slots, okay? So any of these slots could contain something that is related to the smart contract related to the smart contract. So whenever you're storing a state variable, whenever there's something stored, then it will be in any of these positions. 
and uh, depending on what variable, variable type you're using, um, the way it is stored is a little different. Now, the reason why I'm telling you is because for many of you, um, since you have, in many cases, an economics background, um, you will analyze some of these smart contracts later on in the DeFi space. And in some cases, um, when there is no uh, ex when there's no explicit getter function, in some cases when things are a little more hidden, uh, then you have to know where these things are stored when you're doing a data, data analysis, okay? So it's important to understand where things can be stored in the smart contract. It's important to understand how they are stored. And also when we will talk about things like mappings, for example, then understanding the way uh, smart contracts store their variables will help you to understand the pros and cons, so the advantages and disadvantages of different variable types such as mappings. Now, whenever you have something of a fixed size, so uh, fixed size arrays, um, structs, so something that takes up multiple slots hmm, but has a fixed size, uh, then it's just the subsequent slots. So you start with the zero slot and the one slot, two slot, and so on. And of course, when you have something, a variable that only takes one slot, then it's also the next one. So you always start with zero. When this one is taken and you need an additional variable, then it's one. When this one is taken, you need an additional variable, then it's two. And then for example, when you have a fixed sized array that takes two slots, then it would be three and four next, okay? So that's pretty easy. It's easy because you know exactly how many slots uh, these variables will take. And in that case, there is no guessing involved. In that case, you just take, you basically reserve these, that number of slots and then the next variable that gets defined takes the subsequent ones. And that's the, the easy part. When the size is dynamic, so for dynamic size arrays, um, then it's a little different. In this case, the size of the array gets stored, or the length of the array, I should rather say, gets stored at the current position, and the values uh, are in multiple subsequent slots, but it doesn't start right after the, the current position. It's actually a hash of the current position um, that defines the initial position of the data. Uh, and from that data you have, from that point you have subsequent ones. So let me go with an example. Let's say you, the first variable you define is a dynamic sized array, okay? Then the current size of that array would be defined, would be specified in slot zero. And what you would have is the array, the dynamic sized array would start at the hash value of slot zero. So it would start somewhere in this extremely large storage array right here. Uh, and the reason why it's not a subsequent one is because you want to move that away. You, when, if you don't know how many spots it's going to take, then it would be really cumbersome when it when you have it here. And then uh, imagine you define the next variable. Uh, where would you do that? You cannot do it at two because um, you have a dynamic sized array at zero and one. Wouldn't make too much sense because when this dynamic sized array gets larger, then two will be in its way. And when you're moving it away, when you're using the hash value, of the current position and that's where you start with the information um, then at least when we're talking about uh, the numbers we are referring to in case um, of this extremely large area right here uh, then there won't be any collisions and we know no matter how large this area get, gets uh, for all practical purposes there will no will be no collision okay that's the idea so that's why you're just storing the current size at the current position. So in our case, zero, you have the size of the dynamically uh, stored array and uh, you're using the hash value of this position. So in this case, the hash value of zero to start the actual array with the information and just add subsequent slots whenever they are needed, okay? And then we have mappings and mappings are another special case. Uh, with mappings, you always um, I have a key value um, and then of course you have the, a key value pair and the idea is that mappings store nothing at their current position. The values are stored in the slots that correspond to the hash of the respective keys and the position of the mapping. So what does it mean? Let's say you have a key somewhere. This key could be a, a key as a mapping. This key could be the address. So let's say your account and 
the mapping is at position zero, then the information would be stored at the hash value of position zero, which identifies the mapping and the key, which happens to be your account. Okay. You concatenate the information together and then the uh, actual value uh, is stored at the hash of, of these two, um, of the, of, of these two inputs. So current position and uh, the uh, uh, key. So why do we use both? For one simple reason, imagine you would have two mappings, mappings. So you had a mapping here at position zero and then another mapping at position one. And obviously they are relating to do the two different things. So um, one could be, let's say, a, a value of some address. So basically what some address owns in, in um, let's go with a super easy example in one token. And then in the other one could be a boolean whether something has been claimed already by this address and it would be a really bad idea when you're just using the key because the key in both cases would be the address of that respective user okay so of course you have to use uh, something that's unique and unique it is because you use a combination of the key so a combination of the address of that user and also the current position so in this case zero and the address and in the second case one and the address and that's where this information gets stored so what does it mean with mappings the information is not stored subsequently with mappings you really get uh, uh, basically a uh, something that seems random of course it's deterministic when we talk about hash functions but um it's not in a in a subsequent order it can be anywhere in this ginormous uh storage array it can be at, at any position and uh, you only can get it when you uh when you check the key so basically you you, you look specifically uh for this key variable and then you get back the value okay this also makes it, of course, impossible to iterate uh, over uh, the uh, mappings uh, with some exceptions when you specifically um, store, for example, the keys that have already been taken um, in an array, then you can iterate over it, but the mapping by itself, you cannot iterate over it, and you can also not count how many, um, how many slots are taken by the mapping where you have a positive or where you have something specified. So... The first variable type we're going to look at are integers and specifically unsigned integers. So uh, integers that cannot assume any negative values. Uh, in this case, you can see uh, integer right here. You define it by uint, unsigned integer, and we called it answer right here. That's the name of the variable. And with the uh, definition right here, we already assigned the value 42. Don't worry about the public too much. Uh, I will explain in the next video why this is needed in this example. Um, so don't worry about that right now. But basically what you need to know is uint. That's the name of the type, unsigned integer. This is the name of the variable you're specifying. You can give it any name and then you're assigning a value. And it's part of your hello world contract. So basically what you're doing with this contract is just one thing after deployment this number is stored on the blockchain as an answer so the smart contract just says answer equals 42. uint uh, is short for uint 256 um, it's a 256-bit large unsigned integer um, it is the most common type and you can store a single number up to 32 bytes or 256 bits in it non-negative values from 0 to 256 minus 1 can be stored obviously because that's the range uh, where, you have, where you have space for. Um, you can define both signed and unsigned integers. We already looked at the unsigned ones with uint. You can also use smaller uh, unsigned integers like uint8, uint16. So any step of 8 uh, bits is feasible, but under normal circumstances, they are all converted to UINT 256 and you shouldn't really use them. I mean, in some cases it can make sense, but you're doing nothing wrong at this stage when you just stick to UINT 256 or UINT for short, which is the same thing. INT, um, so respectively, is when you have signed integers 
only use it when you explicitly need negative numbers. And the use cases for negative numbers usually aren't that great. Many of the things you're doing, you will be able to do with UI and T, so with unsigned integers, and it's just much easier to handle. Other elementary types you should be familiar with are, for example, addresses. So an address variable stores a 20 byte theorem address. Uh, you will use that a lot, of course, because uh, whenever we talk about small contracts, especially in the DeFi context, they will specifically, uh, they will usually assign something to an address. Uh, they will usually assign some rights to an address, tokens to an address, and so on. And in that case, you need to store the balances of the addresses and, of course, the addresses themselves. And for that, you will use the address type. Then the next thing you should also know are uh, booleans, which are essentially just logical values. So zero and ones or true and false values. It can be used for logical operations. One example I mentioned earlier already is for, for example, when, when a user, a specific address can only do an action once, let's say, um, then you could switch uh, from, from, from claimed or voted or whatever it is. You could switch that uh, that Boolean value uh, from false to true. Uh, and then the next time the user tries with the same address to, 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 to call the same, to invoke the same function, um, then in this case, uh, you could check if this claimed uh, is already set to true. And if that's the case, then you will not allow it to do, they will not allow the address to do that again, as an example. So it's just this logical operator that is usually used for checks, that is usually used to store true and false values. Then you have bytes, bytes 1 to bytes 32. Uh, so uh, it stores just arbitrary data of a fixed size. Um, for example, when you have hash values or you name it, you can use uh, this variable type to store the information uh, in your smart contract on the blockchain. And then you have uh, fixed point numbers um, on the unsigned uh, fixed point numbers um, fixed and u fixed. So it's basically like uh, int and u int. What's super important to understand is don't use them uh, because they, are, they aren't fully implemented yet. Um, so you should stay away from them at that point. I just wanted to mention them um, because they are already part of Solidity, but you cannot do much with them and there are many limitations. So you should stay away from them as of right now. And we will look at more variable types uh, as we use them later on. So the idea is that we will start with a relatively simple smart contract, extend it um, in every single video, and thereby you will get a feeling and understanding of the variable, of the of the of the uh, variable types, and also of course of anything else you need to know regarding solidity. All right. So and. As I said, uh, we have this one project and the one project we're actually doing is an auction platform. So um, you are creating your own smart contract based auction platform that we will use throughout this class. And what you have to understand is there will be, will be one separate contract for each auction um, that anyone should be able to participate uh, and that we start with a simple timed auction and explore other auction types later on. Um, other auction types that specifically uh, create some of the drawbacks we may have with the simple type. But let's let's start as simple as possible. Let's start with a very easy contract. And actually, that's not even a contract you can interact with yet. That's something we will do in the next video. That's just a general structure. So as you can see right here, Again, you have the license identifier on line one, then the pragma statement on line two, on line four, you start the contract, you call that contract simple auction. Uh, this is just a, a comment right here. As I said, when you have double slash, uh, whatever you're typing behind that on the side, same line, it's just a comment, something you're telling uh, the observer of the contract. And then you define three different variables. And these are already some of the variable types you have looked at. The first one is highest bit so the the current the current high the currently highest bit uh, the bit that is currently highest it is an unsigned integer recall that uint is the same as uint 256 so essentially it's this unsigned integer type of length uh, 256 bits or 32 bytes then we have an address type highest bidder so that's the current highest bidder uh, whoever 
has the highest bid as of right now. And of course, that's defined by a blockchain pseudonym, which happens to be an address. Uh, so we use the address, the 20 byte as the address type. And then the bool, boolean at logical value has ended whether the auction is concluded. So this is simply zero or one, one when it actually has ended, when it has been concluded. That's all we store yet. I mean, there is no logic in the smart contract yet, and no flow or anything like that, no methods, functions. It's just the state variables that we are preparing at the general structure to give you some feeling of uh, how these contracts can look. And then we will add the functionality, we will add everything you need in the next few videos. So something that's important in the context of variables is the default values. When you're not declaring the variables, so when you're not assigning a special, a specific value to them, as we, uh, for example, did not do right here. I, uh, recall earlier with answer, we specifically assigned 42 when we uh, declare the variable here we're not assigning any value so in that case uh, the value that is stored initially is the default value of that variable type and with the various types you have various uh, default values with the integer types the default value will be zero with booleans it will be false with address it will be zero address with bytes it will also be uh, just zero uh, array will be an empty vector of length zero uh, mapping may be completely empty. There aren't any keys, so nothing to, to look up. Uh, enum will default to the first choice. That's something we will look at later on, the enum. And strings will just be an empty string. So for example, boolean has ended is the same as boolean has ended equals false. Let me go back right here. So has ended equals false. If we would specifically type equals false on that line for the semicolon, then that would be exactly the same because if we omit it, when we don't specifically type that, it will just use it as a, the, the false statement as a default value for this variable, okay? All right, and this already leads us to the first exercise. And we will use the Hello World contract from uh, this video. So not this contract right here, but rather the contract, where is it again? Uh, let me check quickly. Uh, I have to go back to slide. Here we go, slide five. Um, this contract right here, uh, the Hello World contract and deploy that on the blockchain. So that's the idea that you have your first smart contract on the blockchain that you can just get a feel of how to use these tools and little play, play around uh, with them just for a little bit before we actually get into the more uh, complicated stuff. So the exercise is use the Hello World contract from the integer section of the slide deck and familiarize yourself with the Remix IDE, the integrated developer environment, the browser-based integrated developer environment we've talked about already uh, in the introductory uh, video. So what you're doing is first you're creating a new contract file in this IDE, then you're connecting to various blockchains and emulations of blockchains. So first the JavaScript virtual machine, which is just this in-browser emulation of a blockchain, uh, then uh, to Robston test network, the one we have already used in previous videos, and also the, your personal, your own local Ganache blockchain that we have prepared last time, that you all are also already know how to use. Uh, then you compile your contract. So compiling again is translating solidity in this case to bytecode and then you deploy the bytecode on of your contract on the blockchain and then last thing you do i mean there isn't really much you can interact with right now because there are no functions no methods you cannot basically interact with the contract except for one function and I'm gonna just I'm just gonna mention it right now. I mean that's something I will say again in the next video. But the reason why we defined uh, the answer variable as public is to uh, get Solidity to automatically create a so-called getter function. So the functions we will look at in the next video, uh, these are the ways you're interacting with your smart contracts. And uh, when we are declaring the variable in this case answer uh, as public then Solidity will automatically create one of these getter functions in the background, which allows us to request the value that is stored um, in this variable.
So basically what you will end up with, and that's something you will see in this exercise when you're using the smart contract, is a, uh, is a smart contract, a deployed smart contract that can, exact, that can do exactly one thing. And this one thing is requesting the information that is stored in the answer variable. So basically uh, asking for the value 42. And that's it. I mean, that's just a simple hello world contract. That's just your first contract you're going to deploy. And the idea is that you get some feeling of how to interact with the blockchain. All right, let's go to the Remix IDE. And you find that on remix.ethereum.org. And the first time you're visiting the web page, you will find all kinds of questions, whether you want to participate in helping to improve Remix. These are things we're going to look at later on. I will tell you more about them. It's basically just some help, what you can find where. And the first thing we're going to do is we go to the contract section. Here you can see some examples, example contracts, but we're creating a new one by pressing on this blank sheet. And then we're going to call that one hello world. And it will add a dot sol for solidity automatically. Uh, that's just a file extension. Here you can work later on. Here you can basically write your smart contract. But now let's look at some other sections. That's the file explorer right here. That's the Solidity compiler where we will compile. And that's where we can deploy and run smart contracts later on. So these are different uh, sections we need. As you can see right here, we are at the JavaScript virtual machine from the London hard fork. Now let's actually choose something else, Injected Web 3. And Injected Web 3, as you know, refers to the MetaMask plugin. You can see the account with 5.28 and so on Ether. The same one is here. And uh, recall that we set it to Robston. You can also go to Web3 Provider. Web3 Provider will ask you where you will have the Web3 Provider endpoint. This refers to your Ganache endpoint we have set up last time. And you can see all the Ganache addresses with 100 ETH each. When we switch to more Ganache quickly, you can also see them right here. So that's basically what you have set up. There is an alternative to connect to Ganache, also through Injected Web3. You can simply choose Injected Web3, go back to MetaMask instead of Robston, pick the uh, local host, and then you're also connected to Ganache. Now, obviously you have zero E for new addresses, but when we again copy one of the private keys uh, from your Ganache setup and import them to MetaMask right here, then on import account, paste that and import. Then you can see you also have the 100 leaf. There's actually a, a there's zero, so you have to connect it first. Sorry about that. That's something that could also happen to you. You always have to make sure that MetaMask is connected and now you have the 100 leaf right here. All right. So the, let's quickly switch back to um, Robston. Right here, you can see you're back to zero. When we pick account one again, then we have our Robson account balance. And that's also where we will deploy our contract. Now let's write the actual contract. Start by the license identifier as specified in the earlier in the video. So SPDX license identifier MIT. Then we will define the pragma statement. So pragma solidity, a caret, 0.8.9 um, semicolon, always you use the semicolon at the end. Then we define the contract contract with the name hello world right here, curly brackets. This is the body of a contract. And now we're going to define the UINT. We make it public to get a getter function that we can actually request this value. And uh, we will call that variable answer and set it to 42. Here we have a comment so that other people who are actually looking at the contract um, know what it does. I mean, it's such a straightforward contract. You wouldn't specifically need a comment right here, but it's just good practice to always have comments in your smart contract, which make it much easier for other people to follow along, especially when you have more complex smart contracts. Now let's go to the, uh, to the com compilation tab. Uh, here on the very top, you pick the compiler version. It's 0.8.9, uh, which corresponds to the Pragma. Then you click on the compile button. You can see there aren't any errors. So you have compiled it. And then you go to the uh, deployment tab right here. Uh, we pick Injected Web 3. 
uh, as you know, we are connected to uh, Robston right here. And once you're ready, you simply press deploy, which will trigger this uh, transaction notification. Uh, here you have the hex data, the bytecode essentially. And uh, if you want to deploy that contract, you click on confirm. Uh, and then you basically, you issue the de deployment transaction. Um, of course, you can check this deployment transaction um, on Etherscan, so on your Block Explorer, that's what we're gonna do right now. And you can see it has already been confirmed. So the contract has been created and that right here, that's the contract address. So that's the new address uh, the contract actually has been assigned to. Right here on the lower left corner, you see deployed contracts, you see your Hello World contract and you can click on answer. And when you click on answer, you get the value 42. Uh, so that's basically just you requesting. Now the reason why you don't need a transaction for that um, is because you're not writing anything on the blockchain. So getting a value doesn't require a blockchain transaction. It's just simply obtaining the value from the blockchain as you will see later on. So there is a difference between writing something that um, requires an actual blockchain transaction and just simply getting a value which does not require a blockchain transaction. All right, that's it. Congratulations on compiling, deploying, and interacting with your first smart contract. Next time we will look into the functions and make things a little more complicated. Stay curious. See you soon.